Hello, hello. Welcome back. Today's guest is Nate Spanos. As mentioned in the previous podcast, I met Nate and his wife through Ralston College, a new college devoted altogether to saving classical education. Nate is a musician and writer, and his album Child Coming Home is available on all the standard platforms. He is also working on an upcoming musical called Heart Heart Phone, which will be released soon. Given our time at Ralston, I don't know if there was anyone more beloved in our cohort than Nate which is actually quite remarkable given how disparate all of our backgrounds were. He and his family were exceptionally kind to me, allowing me to run over to their house many a night to cook some eggs on their stove. And those are very good memories. With all of that said, allons-y, and I hope you enjoy. It seems like you you do a lot to to shrink your market if you're going into Christian music, because it, it, even say, the beautiful Byzantine monks that make make music, Mm -hmm. it isn't obvious to me that there's there's a huge market for it. Do you kind of have a feel for, why, why go into... To Christian music, do you, do you think maybe I'm wrong? Is is there a market for it? How, what is what has been your experience like in that world? Uh, I'm sure there is a market for it. There, there are definitely you know lots of Christians and people who oh, listen to music. But yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of why I started making it, it was not so much a savvy marketing decision. It's just okay. based on what I wanted to write and talk that's, about. That's probably the best reason to go into it. Yeah, I I definitely. The core of what I'm trying to do here is have conversations, but I also am trying to have a tech savvy, marketing, social media type of type of headset. Going it's a, it's a hard it. tension between keeping right. on principle and also paying attention to those real life like well, pressures. Then, let me poke at that. Getting something out there. Right. Yeah. You don't want to. You don't want to be a sellout. Say you don't want to. Maybe maybe we can go here. I don't know. You can you can tell me what you think about this. But I think if you're in a if you're in a capitalist society then what i'm trying to do especially if you think about great books for example so we have, we have low editions right here if i'm trying to if i'm trying to market to you homer or boethius that's I, I even just kind of said it. i'm trying to market it to you i'm trying to sell sell you on why you should read boethius or homer etc but it, i don't think it should be like that i think it should be something like i'm going to make something beautiful mm. or i'm going to read something beautiful i'm going to engage it. homer made something beautiful rather and you should aspire to read that. Mm-hmm. It's not a matter of Homer meeting you at your level. It's Homer's up here, and you should aspire to to reach that. So if you're yeah. selling out, I think a good argument as to why selling out is an actual thing would be something like instead of making something beautiful, you're making something where people are and, and meeting them there. So it it's it's more salable. To them. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No, I definitely. Um resonate with the tension you're talking about because in my own music I've sort of had uh, in terms of the genre that I write in when I started I was doing a lot more in terms of sort of classical like through composed settings that felt much more like something out of a music program and less less like pop music Um, I actually sort of had my mind changed on this a couple ways one was through um watching Hamilton okay the musical Hamilton the musical okay. yeah which is just a showcase of lyrical and storytelling ability mm-hmm. while at the same time being in like the most popular medium or genre which is hip hop sure. and just seeing that sort of marriage of those I don't know if you want to say high and low but of the different uh, you know uh, levels was was pretty compelling to me and i think it sort of hit a uh it, it hits the sweet sweet spot instead of in terms of uh like the high and the low coming together the uh you know like very advanced sure. and technical well, and like the completely accessible kind of thing right um that was so that was one part of it but go ahead i was i was talking to i think it was adriana and elijah about catholicism because they're they're catholics and we're, we're kind of like at different levels of Catholicism and, and devoutness. Okay. And uh, talking about Latin, Latin masses, that's what it was. Should we, should we mandate Latin masses or should we reach mm. people at English in, in the vernacular of the particular area, mm-hmm. etc. Mm-hmm. And uh, the point of meeting people, the, the point of the, using the vernacular is to kind of meet people where they are yeah. rather than making something so incomprehensible with, English, with, with Latin rather that... You're just avoiding mass altogether. Whereas if you're making it accessible to someone, then they're more likely to come in and understand the prayers and understand what's going on. And, and then maybe go deeper. And, and then, to the and then maybe go deeper. Right, right. But it's it's a matter of meeting people where they are. Yeah. And she made the point, uh, on, uh, Adriana made the point, that that's kind of what Christ does when he... 
when when he as God comes yeah. down and well yeah right I'll, I'll leave it at that for a second when when he comes the incarnate God right he he has to meet us where we are which is everything that the crucifixion involves and yeah. then then understanding that he transcends it and and in, in embodiment and with you know eating food and right. spending time together right. yeah affirming <clears throat> full humanity and yeah and that's in English, I know it's the shortest verse in the Bible. It's in John. It's it's Jesus wept. Mm-hmm. In Greek, it's Edakris and Oyesis. So it's it's three words. I, I still don't know if it's the the shortest verse, but regardless, mm-hmm. that's that's the only time Jesus at, at the the raising of Lazarus. It's the only time Jesus wept. That's that's how God makes himself. That's that's how he brings himself down to us. Mm-hmm. Socrates never never cries, but he does laugh. So so it's it's reverse for Christ. Christ never laughs. But he does cry. Socrates never cries, but he does laugh. I think it's I think it's one time he laughs. At least it's not Mino. recorded for Christ. Although Chesterton has a great uh, section at the end of his book Orthodoxy where he's sort of musing on the overpowering mirth of God. And you think so? Yeah. See, it's. I mean, it, it's just speculation, and he says that in sure. the book. But, but, uh, yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. I mean, but in I in either case, the principle of sort of taking on the vernacular so to speak right Me- meeting people powerful. where they are so am i going to make am i going to make something simple and accessible like a, a standard pop song or am i going to make something difficult and inaccessible but does i don't want to say it elevates you but you have to at the very least you have to elevate yourself to attain it and then maybe you could say it then elevates you something like it i guess i guess it gets a little tricky there yeah to, but i have a, yeah i have a lot of a lot of thoughts about that. That's definitely been one of the central questions that I've sort of tried to work through in in what I'm doing is how to communicate and to how broad of an audience and in what way. And yeah, so those I'm very alert to those concerns. Sure. You have more thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a I think it's a Catholic argument. Maybe and probably Orthodox. You have. I'm not familiar enough with Orthodoxy to really make that claim. But the notion that that you are where you are and that you have these gradations of of beauty to reach the mm-hmm. sunamonum the sum of all that is that is beautiful and those gradations through through poetry through art through music those are the things that you have to engage with in order to elevate you mm. so one criticism that i often levy against protestants is that it's more of a if you can read the bible and understand god then it's it's more of a direct communication mm-hmm. so as catholics will will have our will have We'll have our set prayers, for example. Mm-hmm. And when you go to mass, it's there's definitely a, a rigid structure to it that has very, very few deviations every single week, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's almost like this distrust with the populace. It, it, to be cynical about it, a distrust with the populace that we can't trust you to say the right things to God. You have to you have to go through these steps in order to reach it. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's why Catholic churches, in particular, are you, Orthodox, probably too. Are, are the most beautiful and there are some residues within Protestants. Lutheran churches are pretty beautiful I, Anglican churches too are mm-hmm. pretty beautiful and I was I was in Charleston this past weekend I guess it still is the weekend that earlier a couple of days ago uh, seeing some pres- Presbyterian churches I think it was that were quite beautiful too mm-hmm. but um, using it's a matter of matter of mediation to get you get you to the top I mean do you have any wrestlings with that when you're thinking about making Christian Christian music? I mean, Which part? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't assume that you disagree, but did, first, does that argument seem sound that you have these gradations up to to God that you you have to engage with things beautiful to God, and that comes through Christian music? Um, I think there's a theological question there, and sure. then there's a cultural question and an art a question of cultural artifacts there. And I think they overlap a little bit around the idea of sacraments, but I'm not sure if I go go for the cultural. Yeah, bit first. What 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 are you saying that there's a when you say cultural? What do you what, sorry? Well, so you were saying, for instance, that um, the liturgy, so the music and the specific set prayers, and then also the architecture, um, is a form of would you say ascending to God? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, Engaging with them, bringing it into your memory. Yeah, I, I think it. I think that's a straightforward Platonic symposium, Platonic argument that the things that you engage with, the the beautiful forms that you, the beautiful particulars that you come to know, give you insight into the form 
mm -hmm. forms of beauty, the various forms, and then the ultimate form of beauty as you continue to engage with, yeah. with that which is beautiful. Well, I think you'll see precedent for that, not just in the Platonic, but also in the, um, you know, in the Old Testament with, say, like the giving of the law and the tabernacle. There are like certain, you know, cultural forms and artifacts, like a big tent or sure. uh, a particular like rite of sacrifice that you use to approach God. Um, so I, I see precedent for that idea. I might have questions about the theological part but <laughs> well then, then push me on the, the theological part why especially especially if you say that there's precedence in, in the old testament why why would you say that there's P push me on the theological part then oh i don't know if i'm necessarily wanting to push you necessarily it's just this is, this is an open question for me of where say the line between like theologically having the permission to approach god and like which forms of sort of cultural expression of that worship are uh, like tied necessarily to the theology. This is coming out of, of course, me being raised sure. Protestant, yeah. and like more, I wouldn't say suspicious, but like it's less, it's less of an assumption that the cultural parts should be sanctioned. Oh, there, that, okay, I think okay. that sort of bleeds down into like sort of a very low church meeting in a garage or warehouse kind sure. of thing. But when, when uh, I was on Jesus says in John when he's talking to the woman at the well and she's talking about the disputes between the Samaritans and the Pharisees or the Samaritans and the Jews and she's saying like your people say we'll worship on this mountain and my people say we'll worship on this mountain so like what is the right form of worship right. and then Jesus says my father is looking for people worshipers who are going to worship in spirit and in truth he just like sidesteps sure. the question of like which cultural expression is the appropriate way and he says like actually it's more of a, a heart thing but again that's also very protestant <laughs> <answer. laughs> well, look, look if, if you're it's not like the catholics and orthodox don't make recourse to the bible all the time too so if you can if you can use the bible as a means of arguing against the catholics and the Protestants, that seems well within reason say mm -hmm. or well within biblical tradition and argumentation say to I really like that, and part of the reason is when I was in when I was in Mexico. Uh, most recently, I got to see some of the 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 svilas, the the parades, sorry, mm. of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Okay. And wow, that was that was quite remarkable. Mm. And there there are there were and there were some of the standard. You have the you have the image of the Virgin. You have some of the priests in their traditional garbs and the altar servers and, and mm. all of that too. But you also had you also had. I don't, you, you also had Mexican dances. You also mm -hmm. had the cowboys, and you had mm -hmm. people on horses, and you had you had some of the Aztec Aztec dances, and you had some of the they even had some American Southwest, like U.S. American Southwest uh, dances and tribes and people people using the indigenous cultures as a means of still honoring, right. at the very least, Mary, if not God Himself. Say. Yeah. So. I like that a lot. I mean, it seems like when it comes to beauty, you know, is I don't I don't know. This, this is kind of a weird argument to make. So long as it's beautiful, then you're then you're elevating yourself. Mm. But then it, then it becomes a question of what forms of beauty are the things that you should be honoring. Right. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts on this one. Uh, this is where I've been helped in my thinking by people like Jonathan Pajot where he talks about sort of universal universal history concepts and sort of as Christianity was spreading into pagan cultures right. them finding ways of like honoring the spiritual resonance in a culture uh, say like this sounds weird to say but even like converting a temple of Aphrodite to like a, a, a basilica for Mary or sure. whatever just like basically like seeing whatever the spiritual impulse was and finding a way to translate that like meet, mediate it meet that people where they are right. and then like point it towards the truth paul does this when he's in athens and he sees the city is full of pagan gods and altars and he doesn't like it and he thinks it's like heretical and wrong True. but he does he still finds one altar that is the uh you know the the altar to the unknown god and he says to them I've showed up here. I'm affirming 
that you are worshiping the unknown God. Like this spiritual impulse you have to like, so to speak, cover your bases, like make sure you're right with the divine is good. And now I'm going to tell you what the truth is. And he, and he goes on to say like, you know, we, you're worshiping in ignorance before, uh, and that is, uh, something God overlooked for a time, but now is the time to like turn to Jesus. So there's obviously still like a call to repentance and like faith that he does, but he honors like that initial impulse. I don't know how to span that moment uh, across culture philosophically, well, but Herodotus kind of does the same thing. So Plutarch famously insults Herodotus. First, I should say Herodotus was called by Cicero the father of history. He wrote uh, a book called Historium, which is translated usually as histories, and that's just a uh, the history of the Greco-Persian Wars and some mm. of the events leading up to it. He goes on many digressions and goes into different cultural Egypt and Persia in particular, uh, and some and some of the various Asian Asian peoples as well. Uh, Plutarch, who's a later biographer, he calls and philosopher as well. He mm. calls Herodotus a philo barbaros. So philo barbaros philo is love. So when you're thinking philosophia, um, more like friendly love, something like that. But but. We'll leave it at that for a second. And then Barbaros, as in, as in barbarian, and at Herodotus' time, Barbaros just means foreigner. So barbarian would be bar, bar, bar. Mm. All the Greeks think the that they're... Babbler. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. They, they think they're just uttering nonsense. That's that's not... That, that's just what it sounded like. So that's, that's where barbarian comes from. When Herodotus uses the word barbarian, he just means foreigner. But later it comes to mean what it now con connotes would be a negative barbarian there they're beneath us type of deal. Mm -hmm. And Plutarch definitely meant it in a negative way. Plutarch is insulting Herodotus when he calls mm -hmm. him a philopapagos. But through through a lot of Herodotus' writings, you, you see this absolute respect for, mm -hmm. for for many of these other cultures. Even there's there's a group called the Scythians and they they take their they scalp their their enemies and drag their corpses around, they drink their blood, there's, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of stuff. But you but you see respect for that culture within Herodotus. Wow. And um a great amount of respect for for Cyrus the Great, who who freed Persia from the Medes, from from a, a group of people that were that had had control of the Middle East at around this time, mm -hmm. Turkey and, and some of the associated areas, and I think Cyrus is is in the Old Testament too. I think he does mm -hmm. something for for the Jews, but there's you see this respect for Herodotus there that Herodotus has for for these other cultures, and he does right. a lot with, with Egypt in particular of trying to assimilate. The gods and saying okay horus responds to uh, corresponds to apollo i think isis corresponds to demeter seth corresponds to typhon so he's he's trying to match them up and bring bring all these cultures into into something homogenous while also still having respect for for the differences that they're in. yeah yeah i have so i have two <clears throat> sort of thoughts one is connected back to your um going on the procession i have a similar story and mm -hmm. then the other one is on um Genesis and okay. sort of the uh, surrounding cultures of the early writers of Genesis. Sure. Hopefully, I can draw this together. Okay, but it's a it's basically around the idea of um, uh, like Protestant biblical interpretation versus which doesn't have much of sort of the cultural forms uh, associated with like. Catholicism and Orthodoxy that with the same kind of rigidness. Sure, sure. So, anyways, well, your story of seeing the procession reminded me of when we were in um, Samos and we went to a village late at night when they were having the Dormition of Mary okay. procession. Yeah, and there were a few things that were striking to me, similar to what you were describing. The Mexican procession. One was that there are these, you know, very old forms of garb, like the priests wearing robes and the censers, and uh, they had a big epitaph, like a giant sort of almost like Ark of the Covenant looking thing with okay. some extra layers to it. Sure. Um, and at the same time as they sort of had those sort of ancient sanctioned orthodox religious cultural artifacts they also had a military marching band right, right like in the you know grecian army garb and then they had civic officials who were 
all marching together sort of in a religious parade. Was that similar to what you were seeing in Mexico? There wasn't necessarily... There was there were police cars in the front and in the back or whatever, but but it definitely that that was more, that was probably more because, this is a parade and we just need to make sure that no one's in the way. And yeah, yeah. The military, the the government definitely didn't seem to have much involvement. There were some people who were military esque, like marching band type of stuff, but that probably they probably leaned more towards marching band than they did military type of. In in the this parade. Been. The actual military men were carrying the epitaph. Right. So it was very, it was like all the different sort of spheres of sovereignty that we sort of keep separate in the American political and religious system. Right. I mean, the separation of church all... and state is, is pretty strong in America. Yeah, yeah. And that would just, uh, it was very much not in Greece. Right. Um, that actually gave me, I think, a picture of what probably like medieval life or Christendom must have been like on some level just the the way that all these things um all these things lined up and i was bringing that up for some reason you're you also going to tie in genesis as well is there oh oh uh, there was another oh, sorry there's a, a second half to that though which was that as the parade was going on <laughs> sorry as the parade was going on i noticed um that some people were studiously not taking out their smartphones and other people were okay. live streaming the whole thing. Yeah. And the as the procession went through the town, we'd stop at various locations. And I was I had live in my mind the whole time as we're walking through this like sort of modern village. Why are these people why are these priests wearing these particular robes? Um, and if this cultural artifact is like religiously sanctioned in some ways, like where is the line drawn sort of, so to speak, technologically for things that are sanctioned or are not. And part of the reason this was live, because was a live question, because when we went to Patmos and we were going into the, the holy spaces, like the, the cave of the revelator or whatever it was called, um, the apocalypse yeah yeah where where john uh had his visions of revelation and, and wrote them down the apocalypse on they the, the gilded hand holes in the the cave where they yeah. think he held on and that sort of thing but on the entrance to those spaces they had these signs saying you know no film or video recording oh sure yeah right which i think the closest we get to that is in certain like museum spaces in the united states which is the closest we can have to like a public sacred space and the church yeah, in, in the Sistine Chapel, system. they they yelled at me for the taking out my phone and taking pictures. And right. I visited in Mexico City the the church on the hill in, in where Juan Diego had the had the Virgin Mary appear to him. They said, "Don't don't take out your phone there as well." Like there are, there are these sacred things that we try not to. I don't know, it's tough. Like why why phones in particular? What what about phones? Yeah yeah. You know? And I went and I asked uh, one of our guides, Crisa. Are priests allowed to have smartphones? And to me, I thought the answer was going to be no. They're holy people. They're set apart from the world. Sure. They have this sort of lifestyle that, uh, you know, has drawn a line, like a cultural line in a certain place. They have to wear these robes from right. this period of history. Um, Get up at certain times in the day and pray. And Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be above all of the hedonism that goes along with phones or at least have like a certain connection to tradition that's like more grounded and has certain like technological like hard lines drawn sure especially if say you're more traditional a catholic orthodox you, you would expect it right right right. and she looked at me like are you crazy and she said <laughs> no no they can have phones yeah they can they can go to the supermarket like what sure what, what are you sure. asking me and i'm just looking around at them live streaming this ceremony and there's just sort of a a big question mark floating over my head how how do you have like the most modern of technology just integrated into what otherwise is sort of a frozen at a certain time moment like what theologically or philosophically like what is the choice that's been made here that freezes these items at this point but allows in items from this point over okay. here 
And the reason, and sort of connected back to the Protestant interp interpretation question, um, I've been reading a lot of books recently about the Reformation mm -hmm. and it being sort of a, a media ecology event. There's a professor at Wheaton called Reed Schuthart who talks a lot about this specific question and he just makes the claim like the Protestant Reformation is a consequence of the printing press. Like, whatever else you want to say about like... I've, I've been thinking about that too. It, it seems like almost an inevitable consequence of if I have to... If all I have to do is think along Martin Luther's lines, if all I have to do is read the Bible and understand exactly what God wants me to know, which is, seems like a reasonable argument given that he gave us the Bible in principle. So mm -hmm. the idea that you need on top of the Bible, you know, 1,500 years of biblical scholarship and interpretation, you know, it, there's an argument. Or, or like it. an institutional hierarchy with a specific building right. and job right. titles to help mediate that part of the thing. But that's, that's hard to get off the ground if if I can just go read the Bible myself. Yeah, yeah. I can have it in every home now. Yeah. So that's that's sort of been a new thought and one that I had very live when we were in Greece encountering one of the older forms of Christianity is just like how does this question of technology sure. get wrapped up with the question of theology um, and do we ever confuse the two? Um, yeah, so... I could go back to the Genesis thing, but I feel like that's maybe a more fruitful thread, the technology, theology if, one. If you want to, we can. But uh, what, Did you have any other thoughts about that first? I don't know. I've So in, in some of my wilder thoughts, I think, especially especially after going through Austin and going through the Old Test, the, the New Testament, rather, in, in some of the original Greek, it often feels... And, and coming from Mexico now, it often feels kind of cheap whenever I go to mass and hear people talk in English. It mm. just feels like, what the heck are we doing? This mm. we could be talk. We could. You've swum in the deep end, and now yeah. you're like, this yeah, is now, a little. Why? Why aren't we show. making philological arguments about the nature of Latin or Hebrew or Greek or what have you? Because not everybody has been able to set apart a year of their life to I, get into the. I know. I know. <laughs> philological but, deep end. <laughs> but that that leads me to think, oh man, if I were a priest, man, that'd be so cool. I'd love to give homilies on. Yeah. Like, why? Why on earth, other than on very rare occasions, do priests not talk about, say, in Catholic priests at least, I, as the Catholic priests that I've that I've seen? Why don't they talk about Augustine? Why are they talking about John Chrysostom? Mm -hmm. Why? Why does it always seem to be talking about the love of God? Fair enough. Whatever. Well, I mean, but, if you've got a limited amount of time to give a homily once sure. a week, probably you want to focus on the essentials. So I but, could see that being. But here, in the case, there was there was one time here in Savannah where. One of the, I think it was a deacon, gave a homily on, the, the reading was the Book of Lazarus, and in his homily he referenced Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment mm -hmm. in a scene where, where Raskolnikov has to read, read the raising of Lazarus. Oh yeah. And now there's this, that that was that was a great little sermon. I, a great little homily. I, I quite enjoyed that. And why, why can't we do more of that? I don't remember the original point and bringing this up, but it, like I said, in my wilder moments, I, I feel like I could, there, there's more potential there. Well, maybe, Crap, I'm sorry. I, no, no, I, I've, and it sort of goes back to the question that we started with, with your adventure on YouTube of sort of how do you, you know, like what, what level of discourse you're putting things at and like, how do you, how do you speak in the vernacular or should you speak in the vernacular? And the questions I think we were circling around with, um, you know, Protestantism and these other forms of Christianity, older forms that have like particular cultural uh, artifacts that they're associated with um, it, it's sort of around this question of uh, the vernacular and of mediation technology is part of that with the printing technology. press being able to sort of like make things more vernacular and distributed more and now with YouTube we have a whole another level of that where it's not just the written word it's actually like right. video and audio that's being able to be distributed about as like with as much of a multiplicative effect as the printing press might have um, and then that idea of the word being made flesh like that's an, that's another way of saying to speak in something's vernacular right right him coming down to us and, yeah, yeah. and crying with us say yeah what I was going to pick up on when saying oh I could become a priest and be so great or whatever um having like a projector and talking about renaissance art 
you know, why, why don't we, why don't priests take, take advantage of that? Because I think it was somewhere local. I might have been Savannah. I probably wasn't. They, they had a projector, and it was kind of just used as a cheap means of advertising their annual funding campaign or something like mm-hmm. that. Good old Catholics that we are. That, uh, that's ubiquitous across all. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. That, that's, that's probably fair. Uh, why, why don't we use it? Why do we? Why do we? I guess yeah. It probably. Well, let me let me ask pre- ask this question. Thing. Why? What do you think would benefit a group of people and say like a people of diverse backgrounds, educations, etc. What what why what would be the benefit of showing them Renaissance art? One stereotype against Catholics is that we don't know the Bible. That you're kind of told you go to church and you are taught Catholic doctrine, some of which, and a lot of which, is going to include stories in the Bible, particular stories. But if you're Protestant, then you know the Bible like the back of your hand because you read the Bible and then determine your interpretation, and then you pick the Protestant denomination. So, so that means Catholics don't often, often. I don't want to be so cynical. It just means that they aren't as familiar with the Bible as Protestants are, mm-hmm. and probably is not as mu- not as much as they should be so if you're so if, if you have your technology you're, you're kind of meeting people where they are and using that as a me- I, if I show you a Michelangelo then I can meet you where you are and show you here's all the theology that's embedded within this painting and use that but I would say hopefully use that as a means to to bring you up but it's also it's also meeting you where you are and using the technology to do so and I suppose with the Gutenberg I, I guess this is it, it's finally clicking for me. That's because this is what you were getting at. Is that with the Gutenberg Press and the expansion of literacy and writing in the vernacular, that's meeting people where they are and then using that as a means to bring them up. As a Catholic, do you, does that mean then that we should put a Bible in every home? Is, if you don't know the Bible, you know, that, that might be a reasonable question. Because if your only exposure to the doctrine is through the priest well then how much do you then then it's then you get into questions of dogma and how much do you trust the priests and institutions and, and all those things too and the, there are arguments to be made there but setting that aside it's like is is the church is is mass enough on its own is the standard homilies that people give is that enough for people i thought the point of the mass was that it wasn't the homily wasn't the center point it's the eucharist yes yes yeah. you're right but but there is a homily within it, so yeah, right. there, there is some element. The the four, but, I'm get, There's a word I'm missing here. There are like four points of the church, something like that. Yeah. It's one, Catholic, holy, apostolic, so as in apostolos, as in a mission sending people out and, yeah. and going and doing the missionary work. So there is that element of Catholicism that that shouldn't be that shouldn't be neglected you know, that's, are you connecting the homily as, to as that a as means sort of, of an apostolic pronouncement of preaching and, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, there, yeah. there is that preaching element to Catholicism even so, if it's not as strong as say a Baptist minister or something like that yeah, yeah. it's still in, in Catholicism so let me think let me think <clears> about <throat> this so um, before I forget I want to come back to the question of up and down especially okay. with mediation sure but the reason I brought up the Genesis thing earlier okay. um, is because um, I guess in the past couple of years I've read things like from John Walton, who's Just a... give me a rundown. I don't know who that yeah, is. Yeah, John Walton is a, um, well, a biblical scholar, Protestant biblical scholar. Yeah, but what he's... What, oh, he's, he's current. Okay. But he's done a lot with looking at um, the... Uh, perplexingly at documents and and like archaeological finds that have come out in like the last 50 to 100 years but looking at like basically the stories in Genesis and then comparing it to the similar texts from the surrounding world at the time like the Babylonians and other things and basically saying like most of the Old Testament is sort of adopting similar tropes and storytelling things especially Genesis and then tweaking them a little bit to make a different theological point so in other words like this flood story in basically everything but in most of the flood stories it's like um i don't actually that's that's not a great example with there's a lot of creation stories and most of the creation stories are stories of 
the gods going to war or of some form of the gods creating humans as their slaves fighting a beast yeah it's usually yeah yeah it, fighting that. a beast and the image of god idea is prevalent but normally about the king whereas the um john walton makes the case that like the genesis texts take um the same storytelling tropes even some of the identical like words and phrases but completely reconfigure the picture of the world that you that that uh would set the israelites apart from the other cultures at the time so instead of there just being one image of god like all the people are the image of god instead of there being a monster that needs to be slayed it's just a creature that god made and is like playing in the in the waters on day four and instead of you know the sun moon and stars being like rival gods they're just like lights god put in sure. the star in the in the sky right, everything becomes subservient to god in in genesis one yeah exactly it, but the point being that there's sort of this this level of culture that surrounds the biblical text um and i guess the relevance to that of okay. that to everything else we we're talking about was that um protestants and uh, so i know this is the way that i was raised have had often have like sort of a golden tablets out of heaven view of the bible where it just has sort of dropped down to us and then it's just ready and yielding itself for accurate interpretation um but to you know take a page from john dravakey's book there's like multiple different kinds of knowing and maybe i think i might have overheard kate bringing this up like the propositional knowing yeah go okay give me, give me a rundown okay great there's he's got different types of knowing truth okay. like propositional where it's just oh, like we, we stating might facts yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going, sorry. procedural like the way that you do something um participatory like getting meaning through being a part of community and uh propositional procedural <laughs> oh no uh, here. and here. then one more p but okay. anyways um all that to say like the question of the cultural artifacts is very interesting to me because um like we get at truth you know through through texts and through cultural artifacts like you know the robes or the liturgies that have been received from our ancestors um but we also get them through like embodied community and i guess i, I am oh, okay. the, the reason i'm not um despite being raised protestant like dismissive of um other forms of christianity is because i see like there's other ways of getting at the truth that are still being maintained maybe more robustly and i like have a lot to learn from but i think i think that the distinction with protestantism to go back to like the printing press idea mm -hmm. is that like the Pro protestantism especially in america has kept a lot more in step with like the technological moment whatever it is like if you go to any uh, sort of evangelical church um it moves like it is it's up to date like cameras and sure. video screens and whatever else and i'm architecture i'm the jury's out whether or not yeah <laughs> architecture the jury's out whether or not like i actually think that is the best way of uh you know staying staying true theologically that's but that particular knot of like technology and theology is is um yeah, it's pretty pretty live for me. So, so could I maybe push on it and support it Please, and say yeah. something like, if there's if there's a handful of different creation stories that are that sort of become Genesis or are taken up and added to and amended and what have you to become Genesis Genesis one rather, then could you still say something like that's still going on now and the technological advancements could facilitate that in some manner. I mean, then, then, then we might be stepping into to heresy territory there. But. Well, I don't know. I know, I whenever I think about these things, I just try to go back to the idea that you know the story of the Bible starts with a garden and ends with a garden city. So some way, one way or the other. Um, when you like, say garden city, does that mean, does that mean Revelation? The, yeah, the city of Jerusalem comes down, and there's sort of the Garden of Eden is in the middle of it. But okay. there's also you know human culture, which at the beginning is like the garden, and then there's Cain's city. And it's just like, oh, these, how are these two going to fit together? And then somehow by the end of the story, they do. 
So I don't really actually know how that works out, but I I do I'm not a I'm not a Luddite, I guess is where I'm trying to end with this. Like I don't give think me, we need to smash all the machines. What's a Luddite? A Luddite the, these are people Remember, I think I'm in England Catholic, like I after the what, I don't know anything in the Bible. I don't know if it I don't think it was so much a theological as it was a like a cultural economic movement, but just people okay. whose jobs were like threatened by machines after the Industrial Revolution and they went and like smashed the machines and like we shouldn't like use these okay okay i see yeah so i'm not saying we should decry all technology yeah. it's just i think th this this feels like where the question is at for for me intellectually philosophically and this might just be also because we're sort of still well going through the first stages of the internet and the it's various uh, is it bodies. is it even worth to have that conversation but that that's one thing that always I, i'm more oriented towards Let's embrace technology. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I am too. <laughs> so. okay, sure. <laughs> One thing that kind of bugs me about the people who want to clamp down on AI, clamp down on gene editing, things along those lines, it seems it seems like it's going to come about regardless of whatever legislation is put put in place, whether it's within the next five years or it's going to be in the next fifty. It's 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 inevitable that things will come around. Yeah. And maybe you can make an argument. Okay, we'll be intellectually prepared or whatever, but. I can I, I could I could rant about that for a second. Sure, Regardless sure. Regardless of whatever happens, though, it seems like it's just going to come about. Regard. I think that's a happen. story. I mean, I think it it most likely will. I I agree yeah. with you, but I don't think that the the role of human agency and deliberation is is out. Like I think we still have a responsibility. To, oh, of course. To think about it and to, to, say, to say the responsibility of of have the argument of what is our responsibility when it comes to handling AI or gene editing. You know, those those are conversations probably worth having. And how do we how do we integrate them into our society? But it does seem like. Like to take a lot of position of okay, we're just gonna get rid of technology. Mm. You know that does seem counterintuitive. So, does that mean we should? Where do, where does the line between technology and cultural fad kind of stop? Like, it, does that mean we're just gonna start integrating all kinds of lights and fancy microphones and cameras into every Catholic and Orthodox church and every Jewish synagogue that there is? Oh. All the real conservative ones. I mean, how much? Well, I I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to prescribe for anyone uh how they how they should do that it's an open question yeah i just think well, i just think those are those are those are two of the driving forces the technology and the theology and i think the overlap of them is not really something that gets pursued or parsed out a lot does that mean we should to go to go back to the the gutenberg press bit you know it Catholics have mass in the vernacular. You know, mm -hmm. they, they don't do Latin mass anymore, unless you, unless you have a parish that really wants to. So it's like, the Catholics have adapted, even if it's taken them mm -hmm. whatever three hundred fifty years to do so. So it's not like it's not like it's out of the question. But, uh, is it a good thing? I don't think so. I lean more conservative. I think on this on this topic. I think it'd be better if everyone were in a Latin mass. And does that mean we should all be living in caves? God. Yeah, it's, that's it. Where that's is the, the line? Where exactly. is the line? Jesus. Yeah, or can you have both? Can you do Latin mass that's televised? <laughs> no, God, because well, because then we neither the, the revolution nor the Latin mass yeah. televised. Man, this is this is a tricky tricky knot to untie, and I don't yeah. know, I don't know exactly where to end it. So we start off by talking about uh, you were asking me about my Christian music, yeah. and um, so recently uh, wrapping up the music production side of it, but I wrote a musical called Hard Heart Phone. Yeah. Which, as you can probably tell from the title, is particularly about this this knot of the theology and technology. And the reason that I think it's important, at least, to think through is because, of course, theology is a way of sort of framing ultimate concerns and life stories, and uh, they, it gives us our ethical trajectories through the world, um, gives us our ethical duties, all that sort of thing. Um, but I think. And, and this is where I've sort of taken a page from Marshall McLuhan and other like sort of media ecology thinkers is yeah. like the technology also has a way of sort of shaping our, our framing of the world. Um, I can continue with that, but it sounded like you had something to say. Yeah, with the televangelists, setting aside just the ethics there in a particular televangelist and the corruption for, or for whatever, you know, I, I don't know the particulars of those situations, so I, I don't want to say anything about that. But to the point of just televising, like if we had a TV here and we all sat down, generally, generally if we're going to watch TV as a family, 
we would all sit down and watch Monday Night Football or whatever, or watch the sitcom or something like that. So whenever you sit down on that couch to watch the television, you are in the headset of Monday Night Football, getting up to use the bathroom, getting up to get popcorn, and sitting around talking and laughing and, and all, the, all the things that go with sitting on a couch and, and watching TV. So if you put on, if you put on televangelism, you, you put on some sort of church service, and you're doing it in this particular location, your brain is, is going to think, man, what, uh, can I go get popcorn? Can I go get, can I go get a, a snack or bathroom break or? Sure, yeah, you, it's a, it's you a can Monday disengage a little more right. easily. It's more on the level of entertainment or but something that's pat being passively received. You're yeah. in an environment that is wholly dedicated to the divine. Yeah, that's great. Then you are going to do what you do in that environment. Thinking about reading, do you, do you want to read on a book or do you want to read on a phone? And in principle, I don't have anything against reading on a phone. There's, it isn't obvious to me that reading on an LED device is any worse than, it might actually be better than reading on a paper that you can kind of barely make out. Mm -hmm. But when you're on your phone, you are distracted by notifications. You go multiple you, other ways. Right, yeah. right. You, you play your video games, you go on the internet and go on your social medias and you do all the things that you do on your phone. And then you also sit on and read. But when you pull out that phone, your your brain is in phone mode. It's not in book at the very least book mode. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's neuroscientists call this Descartes' error. So if mm -hmm. I'm holding a cold cup of water, I'm more likely to wait to rate your personality as cold. If I'm sitting down, the adrenaline is slowed in my body. So mm -hmm. quadriplegics, for example, have dampened emotions. Mm -hmm. So there's something about standing in an environment, and preparing your body for exactly what it is you're going to do that that makes you more ready to do that what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So if that's honoring God, that means going to church and being in an environment where you are primed to do that. Yeah, I read a, a Russian uh, novelist named uh, Eugene something, I forget. Uh, he wrote the, the, the story of the island and um, Brisbane and uh, someone in your comment section will, will write his name. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> but at any rate, he describes going to sort of the Russian Orthodox mask mass and how embodied it is and how they're like standing the whole time or they're sure. bowing down the whole time and it's not sitting and being passive that's so that would be like the participatory kind of knowing from you know for Vicky's four piece sure. and, and, and they're singing in Catholic masses at, at least well in yeah, collective yeah. prayers and there's there's some element of of that embodied cognition within to use the, the psychologist buzzword, yeah, yeah. embodied cognition within within Catholicism too yeah yeah doesn't doesn't seem to be quite as fiery as say like a like a Baptist minister getting getting the crowd riled up like like a Southern Baptist minister rather. Yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe the the ratio or the temperature is a little bit different. And this is actually something that uh, like McLuhan, you Marshall McLuhan, the media ecologist, yeah. like uses those phrases. He talks about as a people group adapts to a different kind of technology. He, he his proposal is that like the their sense ratios change. So like maybe like uh, he makes the case that after, you know, the printing press and print mass print culture became a thing, people became more visual, more linear because of the way that sort of reading trains your brain and your sure. attention to go. Yeah, yeah. And whereas radio, like he, he, he makes the case that like tribal cultures that didn't go through the print phrase phase just took to radio in a special way because it much more approximates like the idea of like, you know, being around a campfire and sort of people. just, it, it's more of an, like an ear culture. So, um, yeah, there's, yeah. There's and, he, and he also talks about sort of hot and cold as like different, uh, different ways of talking about like the intensity of, of your experience within those different cultures, like print, print cultures, more detached or cool or that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, there's there's definitely something to the nature, yeah. The, the the medium is the message type of deal. If you're if you're reading a bunch, I I, I, I want to push towards towards the phones for a little bit. I think if you do the math, people are reading more today than they ever have in history. Yeah. But, but the the quality of what they're reading is is not exactly the same. The, the sentences are shorter. The the words are are much easier to apprehend, and the difficulty of the ideas within the the text that people are reading generally on their phones on on whatever social media that they're reading is is less sophisticated than say picking up Aristotle and reading Aristotle in the original Greek you know there's, there's it could be yeah 
big difference between the two. Depends on your use of it, but for sure. Oh, that's not to say that you can't do that today and there aren't people doing that today, but you, you can get cynical about it. I, th- I think it's, it's a straightforward argument to get cynical about it. You could, you could be optimistic too. If people are reading, maybe that's maybe that's a good thing, but I don't remember the exact original point I was I was trying to take that, but... You were trying to connect it back to those ideas we were starting with of sort of high or low culture, high or, high or low like yeah, media getting, getting back to, content. Getting back to mediation, especially especially thinking about audio too. Uh, if, if you want to be real cynical, you know, you could say... Think, think about the, the development of, of literature. Like widespread literacy has only been around for since since the Reformation, say, so 500 years, something like that. People, human beings are not built to read. Like that's, that's quite a, quite a weird, weird thing. Like I said, it's only been around for 500 years, widespread. And before that, you know, it takes a while before we develop the book, like as, as something you flip through. I think that's around 1100, somewhere around there. And before that, it's, it's a reading on scrolls for, for the academics, for the monks, for the elite, whoever's taking the time to have the education to, to go down and sit down and read then when you think about the development of language there and you it takes a while before you get to the point where you're having lowercase letters and you're having aspirations and you're having punctuation when you're thinking about all those all the old greek writings you know they're all capital letters no no spaces in between the words one line after the other after the other after mm-hmm. the other so so it takes a while before the delineation between some words starts to be made clear and before that you're thinking about the nature of vowels it takes it takes a while Hebrew doesn't have vowels, for example. That you don't you don't write the vowels now. now you kind of can, but um, and if you're looking at the use of vowels throughout history, the vowels can kind of move in out in and out of words pretty pretty fluidly. But the consonants are kind of the core of what makes a word a word hmm. keeps its meaning. So it takes a while before you get get vowels, get written language before before you get punctuation and widespread literacy like there's there's a whole lot of anthropological steps that have to a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through in order for you to get widespread literacy for everybody mm-hmm. and and even even before you have it takes a while before you get the alphabet you, like you're, you're moving from pictograph languages a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of the the american as in like north america south america cultures you know they, they don't have languages so we transliterate them and, and write them out in whatever best manner we can and usually in the, the Roman lettering so it's not like like we, we take we take even having an alphabet for granted or mm-hmm. so so all of that all of that's to say that we did not evolve to read mm-hmm. you know we, we evolved to to listen to people to have conversations mm-hmm. and to take to take the real cynical part of it is that if and everyone knows this but if if you have an IQ below 100 it's really hard to read written materials and understand and integrate exactly what you're doing. So there's an entire industry of of how to make the proper instructions. So like I said, every, everyone kind of knows this because if you pull out a new board game, <laughs> you ask who wants to read the instructions and no one wants to because it's it's hard to read something and even, even if you're smart, it's really hard to read something and understand it and then be able to communicate it with other people and, and make sure everyone else understands it too. Mm-hmm. So making instructions is really, really hard to do. So. All that, all that's to say that reading, reading well is really rare and anomalous in human history, and. But it sounds like when you're talking about things <laughs> like high culture, you're, yes. uh, which, uh, yeah, maybe there's better phrases we can substitute there. But when you're talking about high culture, you're more talking about a, a culture of literacy and of sort of connection to. Um, but even that, you know, masterpieces of the past, and that you you're saying that's challenging, but it's worth you it's worth doing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, maybe it's just the Catholic orientation, but you should you should absolutely be striving towards that which is higher, and you do so through through mediation, through engaging with that which is beautiful, mm-hmm. and that probably means probably means something like going back in times progressively through history reading increasingly difficult texts to reach aristotle plato and homer if if you want i, I think that's a pretty straightforward case but well because then, then that's kind of an argument of oh, it's all in homer and yeah of course maybe, we both have certain pre-commitments here to like the you know veracity of the bible and the importance right, of the western right, right. canon that not everyone's going to share but 
how would you make the case that the case to uh about the importance of maybe the cent- centrality of things like well, the bible and, and or the western canon right. to somebody who's not convinced first of it first first of all so this kind of goes back to this this is a conversation really about a mediation and that you have to assume first off you have first you have to assume humility just on a practical level hmm. that who you are now is not everything that you could be hmm. and what i mean that not, maybe not even everything that you could be. You could be you could be different in some capacity at the very least. Mm-hmm. So maybe that means reading something bad or reading something good, and it transforms you in even just a minuscule way. You exist as in some in in a large part as the potential of whatever different potential outcomes could be in the future, good or bad, what have you. Mm-hmm. So then you have to kind of assume that there is a better future that you could aspire to that you could aspire towards. So maybe that's making something better of yourself, personally, psychologically, what have you, or doing it sociologically and doing something better for your community and, and assuming that that is something, I don't want to say worth striving towards, but that but that it is better than how things are now. So you have to humble yourself before that potential, before that possibility of something something better existing. So you take that, then you can you can probably extrapolate that into better and better goods, and, and what it, what does it mean to, to have the good? But with so you, oh, go ahead. But with that humility, you have to assume that you have to assume that it, it can be there. And how how exactly do you attain that? How exactly do you do you learn to become the better thing? But but the supposition is that is that you could be better, and that you should be better. Maybe that, maybe that's the other thing too. Is that betterness exists, and that. It is better if you if you strive to do. It. It's not a matter of like what you want to do. It's not a matter of, I. I want to attain this thing because it's because it's gonna please me or anything like that. It's because you should do it because it, it would be better, cosmically speaking. Cosmically mm-hmm. speaking. But Michael, my yeah. question. So you're making a great case for the importance of self improvement as just a life project and, like humility as sort of the precondition for that. But my specific question was, okay. what about? the bible and the western canon why do why why should we rank these as higher or worth striving oh, towards specifically why are they worth the difficulty to engage with yeah why why even bother giving it attention given the vast number of things that could be paid attention to other than just that they're old sure sure no, no i got you for you personally maybe just what how did you become convinced because i imagine you didn't come out of the womb reading homer sure sure some of it some of it's just what I sort of noticed in myself after reading Homer. It's just hard to watch movies nowadays. Hmm. But is that a good thing? I like movies. <laughs> now you've become the interviewer, and I'm the interviewer. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the thing. It's like it's I like movies. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to read Homer, let alone in the original Greek. If Greek isn't exactly your ancient Greek, isn't exactly your native tongue. Mm-hmm. Like these these things are hurdles to overcome. So you, so why why should I care about learning? learning the great text what is i don't want to say what has it done for me what happened yeah what happened for you just talk talk about that for a minute because it you can make a conceptual case but i i'm actually curious to hear what how the transformation how the love maybe i lean away from love i think that becomes like a buzzword nowadays because because how the friendship how the fellowship with these ancient texts oh with with them specifically yeah yeah it opens you up it, it's it's kind of important. I, I I push things back to beauty. That's great. That's kind of where where I linked it towards. It opens you up to making more. Okay, okay. We're we're gonna be dancing. I'm gonna put that aside. It's not a matter of what, whatever it's happened to me. It's a matter of matter of do I approximate the good? Like it's 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 a, it's like a premise argument that that I think I think is why I'm I'm resisting the question. It's because it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I whatever I want, it's a matter of what I should do. And what I should do is aspire towards the good. Okay, that's that's kind of a vague answer. What, what does it mean for something to be good? In a platonic sense, maybe that becomes something like that, which is most beautiful. In a Christian sense, there's there's a sense of ethics around it. And then then I then offering it as improbability of its existence type of deal. But Cicero, Cicero makes an argument, and I think he's building on Aristotle, that not only is virtue what you should be striving towards, but it's also it's also 
is also that's that's where happiness lies. It's it's in doing that good for other people, mm-hmm. in a Christian sense. In I think I think he was making the case more in like friendship that if you're if you're a friend with someone here's here, here's the best way to make the argument. If you're a friend with someone, then it has to be grounded in truth. Mm-hmm. It has to be grounded in complete trust of that other person, mm-hmm. and that means that it has to. I have to be an ethical person if we're friends. If I have, to, I have to be an ethical person, and you have to be an ethical person, because if you aren't an ethical person, then I can't trust you. I can't. I can't. If you ask me to do something to rely to 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 rely on you in some manner, and vice versa, then if there's something you're doing behind the scenes that I don't know about and I don't like, then one that comes out in the open, I just get walloped, and mm-hmm. that's not going to be good for me. That's not going to be good for you when you get walloped because I won't be able to defend you, and I, because I won't know exactly what's going on and I won't be able to rep- I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to reprove you and say hey you should be fixing this up and whatnot so depends on what you're aiming at and depends on what you're aiming at is it, is it the good and it seems to me that friendship is one of those things that approximates the good most something like that hmm. so if you if you want to be if you want to have friends and you want to be if you want to live a good life, then that means ethics. And how do you come to know ethics? Well, a lot of it's in the stories that we teach. And I think it's kind of, we kind of almost take the story of Christ for granted. Nowadays, we kind of just assume if if we, the story of a king born in a major, wanting the best for everyone, sacrifices himself at the end, that's, that's a good story. And it's almost trite at this point, but really, that takes a long time to be able to articulate. Like all, all these stories of, okay, is it Achilles? Is it is it Odysseus? Is it going to be some of the, some of the Old Testament patriarchs? Is it going to be Apollo? Is it going to be Horus? Like, what what sort of character do you have to be to, to be someone worth aspiring to it? Mm-hmm. And it, when you read the great stories, that's what you're figuring out. What is worth aspiring to to be, and their experience in that. Like if if you think about if you think about Prometheus from Prometheus bound from Aeschylus, it, maybe maybe this is kind of where I learned to articulate it best. It's something like if you're Prometheus is a self sacrificing person who stole fire from the sun to create to give to give humans the crafts so that they wouldn't perish at the hands of Zeus, and Zeus punishes punishes Prometheus for it. He, he's eternal. He's He's going to be eternally tortured as a consequence. Yeah. Zeus doesn't come out as such a great character in, in that in that story. Prometheus does. There's sort of this proto-Christian element to to Prometheus bound, hmm. and I think you see that in a lot of the a lot of the Greek plays. It's like they're they're kind of testing some of these ideas. And we say with with Antigone and Sophocles, for example, it's like okay, maybe maybe we're putting we're putting human law and kingly action subservient to divine law. We're kind of testing some of these things out and saying, "This is where this is where things start to break down, and we we push towards that which is ultimate, good, the ultimate good." Like it, it seems like monotheism kind of uncovers all of the the paradoxes. I know, kind of just always pushing back towards towards the premise of of what is good, but you're kind of you're making a kind of you're saying that these texts sort of. These are, are concerned with the ultimate questions right. for one thing, which we all should be, tell. and and how to be this sort of the person. Best way that to live your life, right? become that, like how to uh, make friends, how to good. how to make a kid laugh, how yeah, how to take care. You of You read people. them frogs, by <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Aristophanes. Well, no, probably probably like not. a censored Aristophanes, something yeah, yeah. like that. But you're also making a convergence argument that like these sort of questings actually converge on a point, which is it seems like, to Christian be like, story. Well, I mean, can can someone argue against that for me? I mean, I don't think it isn't obvious to me that you could tell a better story than the Christian story. And I mean, just you, can, I think you can make an argument that. What What about the story that we don't have to rely on God now that that's that is all oh, happened? God is dead, and and we can uh, through our own, you know, oh, like, muscular like achievement, Eugene? technological well, advancement, and political affiliation, like make a better world for ourselves. Transvaluate values and, and whatnot. Yep, is that a better story? What does it lead to? 
I mean, thinking Aris- in an Aristotelian manner. <laughs> what? <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> if if you say it leads to utopia, then now you're creating the god of whatever utopia is. Yeah. Right. It, if so, you don't think it's a you don't think this is a better story that if if we're making ourselves in, I, I I can't escape the fact that the conclusion rather that the modernists are really just sophists in disguise. Hmm. Like if you if you're continually making recourse to yourself, ultimately I think grounding out in in Nietzsche, and then I think that you kind of get postmodernism out of out of the modern world at Nietzsche. So how do we know God if it's so important to know Him, and we shouldn't just go off on Ethics, our own strength? I think I think you do that through stories. I think you do that through through the great works. I, that's they're teaching you. How but they don't teach the world. great works in church. Do we know God at church? <laughs> They teach the greatest story in church. That's okay. that's what it is. I mean, it's it's not like learning the Iliad isn't important, but the Ili- I think a lot of these plays are just just exploration. So so you can mm. think of you can think of the Platonic dialogue, uh, the Euthyphro. It, there's a famous Euthyphroian trap where Socrates is trying to figure out what is piety. Is piety that which is loved by the gods, or yeah. the gods love that which is pious? Like there's there's a paradox there, and it ends in an aporia, and ends, ends without a, a proper conclusion, because, because it's a paradox. There, there is no conclusion. What, what does it mean for something to be pious? If you have polytheism where gods disagree with each other, mm-hmm. then, then you're confused, and there's no, there is no conclusion to that. Mm-hmm. So, so you, so you is see. Is God bound by his own laws? Is kind of the way that this shows up in Christian theology, right. also. Right. I mean. Paul gets to that question, that aporia at the end of Romans 11, and then in Romans 12 goes into, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. <laughs> How unsearchable his judgments in his past beyond finding out. He's just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so but, it sounds like a perennial human problem to sure. not be able to solve it. But, but I think... I mean, it's a, it's, a peren- it's a perennial problem in the practicality of how that manifests in its everyday life. Like, it... I think I think this is why in the New Testament the, the laws of the Old Testament have to break down, because if you have these laws and they're competing as to which which law is most important, and then you have these weird particular contexts where it seems like like do do we stone the woman who committed adultery? Maybe in some contexts we should have. I don't I don't want to just paint the Jews as the Old Testament is merciless because mm-hmm. it seems like there's some in there, like Tom and Gomorrah, for example, trying to trying to talk God down. There's this sense where, in in the New Testament, we're not mo- we're not we're not making negative arguments as to things that you can't do and, and trying to figure out which one is which which law has to has to apply in this particular situation. It's a matter of we're aiming at God first, and then we figure out the snake path that that leads up to up to that position. Oh well, no, I don't think so. I th- I like I like I think that's a very powerful way of framing it. But I think it's actually more like God has His law. And it's like very high and it does embody like the human ideal maybe elements of it like for particular cultures at particular times like with the jewish law but then i think that the story of the gospels is like uh you know the word becomes flesh jesus becomes a person and then he's born at the right time like under the law and then he fulfills the law in his person and then you know dies and is resurrected but then through you know belief and faith and sacrament and all that kind of stuff then the humans instead of going like trying to grab onto god or find their way up to god just have to they have they have to believe accept and become united to jesus and then like all of those threads sort of (laughs) come together in one point and then his and then he sends his spirit to go and live in his people and and then it gets worked out in context from there right which is also why i'm not concerned about the technology question ultimately is because of the whole like sure. jesus saying to his disciples like I'll, I'll send you the spirit of truth and he'll be with you to the end and like you'll find your way through yeah, yeah. that's i was sort of arguing that but i see i see where we'll, we'll bump up against each other because that's definitely a protestant argument that, that the faith comes first and then then the works will just necessarily follow so long as you have the faith element Seems like it's a, it's a Lutheran. Oh, uh, I w- the point I was driving towards because yeah, I wasn't trying to set off that particular landmine, and I, I think <laughs> it's maybe a little more complex than Luther's framing of it is sure. just that 
like all of the points converge in the person of Christ and it's God coming down to us, not us finding our way up. Right. So if I have a like a hesitation with the whole project of like humanities education and great books and stuff, it's like it really it isn't necessarily for everyone. I think there is something in it for everyone, but I don't think it's necessary to get to God to go through the path of the humanities. But for some people, certainly it can work that way. And also it can enrich people on the path. There. That's my opinion. It sounds like for you, like it, it had a very formative effect in sort of opening you up to ultimate questions yeah, and ultimately absolutely. to. But I, but I want to make the case that it's necessary being, being not Protestant, say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you th- so? Is that a, a Catholic position to say that like the, the great books, so to speak, are a necessary part of o- almost like have a canonical status? Not, not that that's part of it. I'm not right. asking you to speak for the church, just basically. Right, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. It, but there's, where, where the Catholics really get at it, it's not necessarily through the great books, but it would be through the particular, the, it'd be through the Hail Mary, it'd be through the rosary, oh, it'd right. be through the rites and rituals of, of mass, it'd be through, okay, you have these holy days of obligation you have to uphold, and you have to get the little mark on Ash Wednesday and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So there's these, it's not necessarily through the great books in particular, but they do seem to have reverential status within the church it's more the mandatory stuff is, is more the roads the roads and r- routines that you have to go through mm. as part of Catholicism mm. that that becomes the mediation we've talked a lot about the mediation question I uh, it, we are well over holy well I would love to talk more about like the technology and certain uh, forms of activity in the world that are like ethically mandated by a technology we have or True. whether or not they are whether we just feel that pressure and because that's kind of what the musical i wrote is about is oh yeah that, we, that, we meant to that question bring some of that, okay, especially that's okay we have a lot of common ground in both having been ralston students and sure. wrestling through like some pretty big questions and hopefully we'll just get some more reps at this yeah. but i am very grateful that you're taking the time to share the things you've learned and to draw out other people <laughs> I, I really hope it'll be you know a blessing to everybody who watches it thank you very much and thank you for coming on the podcast man thanks for having me thank you ever so much for watching if you enjoyed that conversation with mr nate spanos then you will enjoy this conversation right here with mrs kate spanos or if you like you can check out this conversation with andrew aviste right there it's up to you